So regardless of the specific host that a virus um, targets, or the mechanisms that the virus uses, there are, a, there are certain steps, sort of a shared um, series of steps that viruses follow in their infection and reproduction um, cycle. So the steps that are, as they're outlined in the textbook, are defined as attachment, penetration, uncoding, replication, assembly, and release. So, um, we're going to just sort of talk about these steps as one overall broad um, kind of kind of picture, kind of overview of the of the system. So what ha what really happens throughout these steps is that you have to um, get the virus to attach to a receptive cell, which we've talked about a little bit with um, using those those cell membrane receptors, and then you have to get the cell to essentially take the virus inside of itself. Once you have the virus inside of the host cell, the viral core that contains the DNA or RNA, remember, is released. And that nucleic acid, that genetic material, can begin to interact with the host cell's machinery um, and sort of become hijacked in that, in that way. So it's going to look a little bit different depending upon the type of virus. So you have DNA viruses. Um, RNA viruses and then RNA retroviruses, they all do this just a little bit differently. So viral DNA, uh, viruses that use DNA in their viral core, they can, they just essentially inject their, their DNA into the host cell, which is then directly transcribed into viral messenger RNA. So the same um, enzymes that are already present in the host cell, the same mechanisms are sort of just borrowed, right, hijacked essentially, to make viral messenger RNA. That mRNA is then translated into viral proteins. So the host cell is manufacturing proteins that are actually coded for in the viral DNA. Um, RNA viruses, you have RNA viruses where the RNA is essentially used as a template, where just copies of that viral um, RNA are used to make more viral messenger RNA, and then that messenger RNA is encoded into proteins using, again, the cell, the host cells, um, ribosomes, and enzymes and things like that in, in many cases. And then you have RNA retroviruses, which are kind of the weirdest ones. They are, um, their viral core is made up of RNA, but they use reverse transcription. So they actually, um, turn their RNA back into DNA, which is then transcribed into viral messenger RNA and translated into viral proteins. So it's sort of a backwards um, way of doing things that introduces that extra step of having to actually reverse transcribe RNA to DNA and then DNA back to RNA um, and then RNA into proteins. So retroviruses, sort of an interesting side note, they tend to mutate really quickly because um, introducing that extra step of having to go from RNA back to DNA before you go from DNA back to RNA again introduces more opportunity for mistakes in transcription to be made. Um, and the enzymes, reverse transcriptase, is actually um, sort of less efficient or, or less um, accurate, I guess you could say, than um, regular enzymes for transcription are, and so mistakes tend to happen more frequently. So you get mutation happening more quickly in retroviruses, which make them more difficult to um, design vaccines against um, and treatments for. So it's kind of just an interesting side note about retroviruses. Um, but it doesn't really matter, regardless of whether you have a DNA virus or an RNA virus or an, a retrovirus, um, the objective is the same. The end result is the same, and that is to essentially make more copies, make more virions, and then release those virions into um, the host system to find other cells in which to, um, to infect and then in which to make additionally more copies of yourself. Um, so virions can be released from a host cell in a couple of different ways. So they can um, get out, essentially get dumped into the system um, all at once when a cell ruptures or lyses due to just damage from being infected by the virus, um, or when the host cell undergoes apoptosis, um, which you may remember from previous biology lectures, 
um, refers to program cell death. So um, one example of how this works is when your immune cells, specifically natural killer cells in the vertebrate immune system, um, are one of their jobs is to recognize viral infected cells um, and then mark them for death, right? Mark them for apoptosis. So a virally infected cell is recognized. Um, natural killer cells go to work doing what they do, punching holes essentially in the plasma membrane of the infected cell, allowing other enzymes in that sort of trigger the cell death process, which effectively kills the infected cell, can also effectively kill the virus that is inside the cell, but by the time this has all happened, the virus has potentially already replicated and made some other virions. So when that cell dies um, through apoptosis, those virions are released all at once in that way as well. Another way that viruses um, can release their sort of progeny is through a process called budding. And budding is um, a little bit more advanced sort of in an evolutionary or adaptive sense. Um, so budding happens when a virus infected cell releases one virion at a time. Um, and by doing that, you are able to spare the host cell. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the host cell is healthy because it's virus infected. And so very frequently those cells are already operating uh, at a suboptimal sort of level or um, are not operating normally but by not exploding basically and dumping all of those virion virions out into the system at once, the cell um, can live a little bit longer. So this is um, another figure that comes from the textbook. This is sort of a schematic of how the influenza virus does its reproductive cycle. And you can sort of see the steps, um, attachment, and then the cell engulfing the virus, viral contents are released. Um, the RNA is replicated and used to make viral proteins. The interesting part, I think, that um, sort of shows this process of budding is, is in number five, where it's actually showing that the um, virus is, it looks in the image that like it is being um, exocytosed, which essentially is kind of what budding is. So the interesting thing about this particular example, the influenza virus, is that it's an enveloped virus. So the virus makes itself this envelope out of um, out of pieces and parts, right? Constituent parts that are already in the, the host cell itself. So when it makes this envelope, the envelope is similar in structure to the plasma membrane, which allows that envelope to fuse with the plasma membrane. Um, and then essentially bud out through a, through a process that is very, very similar to exocytosis. So the cell at this point in time doesn't undergo any damage from the escaping virions and is able to sort of live to see another day. Um, so the question at the bottom of the slide that I want you to think about is what advantage does this confer to the virus? Why is it better to sort of use this sneaky system um, of enveloping your, your virions and then budding out rather than just exploding and releasing a bunch at one time. Um, and I think that that's pretty, it's a pretty logical step to think about why that would be adaptive or advantageous to a virus because the longer a host cell is alive, the more you can exploit that host cell, so to speak. So. Anytime that you're talking about a parasitic relationship, there is sort of a balance that has to be struck between uh, the virulence of, of, of a pathogenic parasite, right? So how, how damaging is that parasite to its host cell versus um, how long can you keep that host cell alive? So a really good parasite is, is good at both making um, use of the host cell's resources, but also doesn't kill its host too quickly because a dead host is no good to a parasite um, or a virus. So it's sort of interesting thing to think about from an adaptive standpoint.